Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, bless this time of hearing. Let the words we hear not cloud our ability to listen to the words you speak. In Christ we pray. Amen. Today we continue to look at the final conversation Jesus had with his apostles before he was arrested. Jesus did not leave a last will and testament, but I suspect if he did, this section in John would be it. What he had to say in that final conversation, John recalled as his gospel was being written. We do not have time before Maundy Thursday to take a look at the entire discourse, but I commend its reading to you, especially during Holy Week. It begins with the 13th chapter of John, verse 31, and it goes through the 17th chapter, which is the prayer Jesus prayed for those he was leaving behind. We will be taking a look at that prayer during the Maundy Thursday service. The entire discourse concerns the relationship of Jesus to his followers and of his followers to each other after Jesus was no longer physically present with them on earth. Today's sermon text picks up about in the middle of that discourse in chapter 15. By way of background, in chapter 13, Jesus had told his apostles that his new commandment was that they would love each other as he had loved them. In chapter 14, he expresses concern about the grief and the sorrow that they are soon to experience at his loss, and he tries to comfort them. The entire chapter has some very important words of comfort, but Probably the, the kernel of those words are contained in verses 18 through 20. You will find that if you want to look at it as I read it on page 1129 in the Pew Bible. This is chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. To say that the apostles had a little difficulty following what Jesus was saying is a vast understatement. I suspect that we can all empathize with them because I suspect it's a little bit difficult for us to follow what Jesus means for us and for the way we live our lives. But Jesus pressed on saying what he knew he needed to say and had only a small amount of time to say 
knowing that it would soon all become clear to them as it became a lived experience. So following further along now in that discourse, we come to our sermon text for today, which is chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, and then 9 through 11. Listen for the word of God. I am the vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now down to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of the sermon is actually the title of the first book by Reverend Andrew Murray I ever read. Andrew Murray continues to be my favorite author of devotional and meditation material. In the first paragraph of the preface in the book titled Abide in Christ, Reverend Murray made the following statement. During the life of Jesus on earth, the word he chiefly used when speaking of the relations of the disciples to himself was, follow me. When about to leave for heaven, he gave them a new word in which their more intimate and spiritual union with himself in glory should be expressed. That chosen word was, abide in me. Reverend Murray goes on to express the concern that there are likely many earnest followers of Jesus who do not understand what that means. And I dare say he is correct because I imagine most of us are a little unsure of what Jesus meant by that command. Doubtless, we will never fully understand that. We certainly will not understand it fully at the end of this worship service, and maybe not even at the end of our lives. And I don't think that understanding it or figuring it out is really the important matter anyway. I think the more important matter is the journey toward comprehending what Jesus meant by that command. Because as we take that journey, we are on a journey of ever deepening and ever broadening the meaning of what Jesus means for our lives when he says, abide in my love. So for these few moments, let us reflect on the meaning that we might take from this in this moment and look forward to future moments when we might understand a bit more. This kind of relationship to his followers is of great importance to Jesus. And to help us understand, he uses the analogy of the vine he compares the relationship to the way the branches of a vine are attached to the vine. Now, the first image I suspect we all get is that of a grape vine. The vine grows out of the ground, the branches grow out of the vine, and grapes grow on the branches. This was a familiar image in Jesus' day, and it's still a familiar image in our day. It seems like growing grapes is one of those 
timeless endeavors that is meaningful for past, present, and future cultures and civilizations. The vine, the branches, and the grapes are a dynamic, living thing. Life-giving sap flows up through the vine into the branches that turn it into nourishment for the grapes. Each part is distinct from the other parts, and yet all are integrally connected. Each part has a role to play that is vital to the life of all the parts. No part exists just for its own sake. No part can maintain its life apart from the vine. Above all, none of the parts can survive once they are detached from that vine. Each part is fully dependent not just on the other parts, but most importantly on the vine for nourishment. The vine bereft of parts can always produce more branches, but none of the parts can ever produce a new vine. And none of the parts can become the vine. We should also note here that a grape vine has many branches, not just one. Jesus' analogy tells us that we are each a branch on that vine, and as such, we each have a role to play. We are each to produce grapes, but we are also all united to each other as we are united to Christ. As much as I think we probably grasp the meaning of the vine analogy, I wonder if we stumble over the physicalness of that analogy. It seems a rather big leap from understanding how a grapevine produces grapes to our relationship in Christ. We do not have a physical attachment to Christ. We do not have any sort of physical relationship to him. Ours is a spiritual relationship. And when we ponder the idea of that sort of relationship, the idea of being attached or growing out of begs a lot of questions. We often think about being attached. We attach to things, to other people, even to rituals. This kind of attachment is more like the grasping and holding on to and not wanting to let go. Jesus is talking about something entirely different. He is talking about being united with. The Greek word for abide is meno, and it can mean not only abide, but dwell, remain, stay. Jesus' directive is that we dwell, remain, stay, abide in him, meaning that our life is so integrally attached to him that we are united with him as branches are united to a vine. Perhaps it would help to put this relationship in the context of another relationship. I once knew a person who, as a small child, did not grow up in a loving home. The person reported instead an abused upbringing. 
As we all know, such an upbringing can scar a child for life. We might say this child was not attached to a vine that nourished it with love. But there had been a grandparent in that child's life who loved the child with the kind of deep, unconditional love that nourishes and provides for healthy growth. In childhood, the person had been attached to the grandparent vine with a connection that was quite different from the connection to the parent vine. The child did not live with or even physically near the grandparent, but that didn't matter. They were connected by love, and love flowed through that connection nonstop, whether they were physically present with each other or not. As a very successful adult, the person once commented that even after the grandparent died, that love still flowed through the soul of that person. The experience that person described touches on the message that Jesus is trying to convey when he says, abide in my love. He was trying to communicate that message to those who had loved him dearly and felt so deeply attached to him as he knew he was leaving them. It was not physical life they received from him. It was not the physical bread and wine that gave them life. Those elements symbolized something far stronger and greater. Those followers had attached to Jesus because he loved them with an unconditional love that was life itself. That love fed their souls and their spirits and profoundly deepened the purpose and meaning of life. Their relationship with Jesus and ours is life itself. Jesus' physical presence is not needed in order for his followers to abide in him. Abiding in Christ has to do with spiritual life, not physical life. But it is very real. It is not just some ethereal concept. Abiding in Christ means abiding in the love of Jesus. And it means that love flowing into our spirits. As we move toward Palm Sunday, we become aware that human life and experience take place not just on a horizontal dimension with all of the social, career, intellectual, and athletic experiences that entails. It also takes place in the vertical dimension with experience of God and the sacred. Experiences in the horizontal dimension cannot nourish the vertical dimension of our lives, nor can they provide the depth of meaning and purpose to our existence that the vertical dimension provides. That's what Jesus is talking about. 
being fully human means we live in both the horizontal dimension, physical, psychological, social, and vertical, spiritual. Our earthly lives are lived out at the point where those two axes are united. Jesus tells us that he is our life source and that we are able to abide in him because he makes us able. We are to abide in him to receive the nourishment that keeps us spiritually alive and productive. The life Jesus gives is eternal life, and our experiences of God and our faith experiences put us in touch with that eternal life. Here now again, the words of Jesus with which we began this sermon. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We have only begun to scratch the surface of understanding that command. May Christ bless us as we go forth from this place for the rest of our lives with an ever deepening and broadening understanding of what that means. Amen. Please stand and join together in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.